Yes, our Bible study today is on Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 21. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of righteousness that comes through faith. We know that uh, it is only because of what Jesus has done for us that we can ever stand in your presence. And so we're so thankful for what Jesus has done. As he died on the cross, our sins died with him. As he rose again, so we have been given new life. And through our baptism, you have claimed us. We look forward to the, the resurrection of the dead where uh, we will join you in heaven with all those who have gone before us. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, in the book of Romans, you have given to us these words of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, let's start by reading at chapter 3, verse 21. So Paul continues to um, explain, I guess just before this, we had looked last week about all the Bible verses from the Old Testament that he um, get, gives in order to show how we all fall into the category of sin. I mean, not, you know, he was using a lot of quotes that talked about um, people who were evil, people who were rebellers against God, and people who were, um, had uh, you know, arrogance and pride that caused them to, uh, to reject God and to attack God's people. But the way that Paul quotes these verses, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't quote the, the noun at the beginning of the psalm and say, you know, evil people do these things, and then, then they would say, you know, and they, nothing that they do is good. He only quoted the part that says nothing that, n- nothing that a person does is good because he wants to apply it to us. He doesn't want us to say, um, oh yeah, this is a verse about somebody else. He wants us to say, oh, I'm, I'm falling short of God and his glory and his will. So the, these quotes from the Old Testament were Paul's way of saying, see, God has already condemned sin and everybody is a sinner and so you can't get away from, from this uh, problem of sin. But now he's giving the solution in verse 21. He says, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So for Paul and the people in the first century, the Bible was the law and the prophets, and sometimes they would throw in the word and the Psalms. See, because the three parts of the Hebrew Bible are the Torah, the law, which is the five books of Moses, right? And then the the word prophets represents what what we would consider to be the uh, history books, because in the Hebrew thinking, these are called the former prophets, that's Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. So they have four books of former prophets for the, in the Hebrew Bible. And then the four books of the latter prophets, which would be the writing prophets, see they, like, they have a symmetry. So the, the Hebrew Bible has you know, four, four former prophets, four latter prophets. The latter prophets include um, I, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then they have a, a, a book called the Twelve, which is a single scroll in the ancient world that all 12 of the minor prophets fit onto one scroll. So they call it the Book of the Twelve. So, so you can see how they had um, the, the prophets are really what we would consider the history books and all the prophetic writings. What about Chronicles? What is that? Uh, in the Hebrew way of looking at the Bible, Chronicles is considered part of the writings. So the third part of the Hebrew Bible, you know, they've got the Torah, or the law, the prophets, and the writings. The writings include all the books of the Bible that are considered to be not necessarily written by a prophet, but are are, um, helpful for teaching God's will. So you've got the Psalms, which are for worship, right? You've got the books of wisdom, like the Proverbs that teach you about life. And the book of Chronicles is considered part of the writings. And the reason is because um, it, it was written after the exile or during the exile, and it, it almost quotes exactly what First and Second Kings say. Okay, but First and Second Kings was written during the time of the kings, and it explains what ha- why the people were going into exile. But the Book of Chronicles is looking back, and it tries to explain why the exile happened. It was because it was written afterwards, so it was a reflective reading. And so, even though it's very similar, the Hebrew people considered it part of the writings because it is kind of a commentary on the history of God's people. Because if you when you when you compare the two sections. Kings and Chronicles, you'll find that Chronicles adds commentary. For instance, the, the, the first one that comes out in my mind is there's a, a time where David had a, uh, um, he was um, having a, a census to count all the people in Israel, right? First Kings simply says, David had a census. First Chronicles says, 
Satan put it into the heart of David to have a census. And why is that? Because the reason why he was trying to count all the people was so he could figure out how many people he could put into an army and how good he could look to the other nations so that he could brag about it. And so the people of Israel, as they, as they wrote about this part of their history, they were trying to figure, why did we go to exile? And so they started to see the seeds of the, of the sin that led to the exile already in David's time. See, David was a great king, but it, his pride and his arrogance started the slippery slide to exile, right? He, you know, he, he had the pride in his heart, so he did this census. And so they, they say, you know, and of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, the writers of the uh, book of Chronicles, which most likely would have been some Jewish priests who were in the exile, right? They, they would have taken the, their source material from the book of First and Second Kings, but then they added these explanations so that the people of God who could read this history would say, yes, we are at fault. We went to exile because we were sinners and our leaders were sinners. See, because just before the exile, you think about how the kings of Israel, they, they said, oh, God would never destroy Jerusalem because this is his temple and we are, and David's throne is here and God made a promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God would never allow his, his line to end. So they believed that they were safe and they were sinning and worshiping idols, but they said, oh, God wouldn't let this happen. And when it did happen, they couldn't believe it. So second, uh, first and second Chronicles was, was written to explain why the exile actually did happen, as you understand. So it, so it wasn't so much a history for them. It was considered to be part of the writings. It was a commentary explanation. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the writings is kind of a catch-all. Anything that's not in the books of Moses or these books that are considered the prophets falls into the writings. Uh, but Paul, when he's writing here, he says, you know, that it's, the righteousness that's been, that um, a righteousness that comes from God is something that God has talked about. And he says it's apart from the law, but it was already known in the law and the prophets. So what, what is he talking about when he says a righteousness from God? See, a righteousness is, is um, a right relationship. How does a right relationship come to us? It says it has to come from God, and it's not, it's not by preaching the law. You can't tell people to be good enough. So where does this come from? A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. What does the law and the prophets have to say about a righteousness from God? So he's, he's not saying this is a new thing. So, see, people were trying to say, some of the Jewish people at the time of Paul said, Jesus isn't the Messiah. He's a false Messiah. And then Paul said, no, look at what the Bible says. You are not saved by being a good person like the Pharisees were trying to push. You were saved because of what? By his sacrifice. Right, and then, well, if Jesus died, that pays for your sins. But do you receive that? By faith. By, by faith. A righteousness. By, so faith is the key. And so when it says that the law and the prophets testify about this righteousness that comes, and he's going to say it a little bit later, by faith, well, that's actually the next verse, uh, it, it is seen in the book of Genesis, Right, Genesis, my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Genesis um, 17, verse 5. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as faith, as righteousness. He, yeah, he believed and his faith was credited as righteousness. That's what it says. So, the, and in the book of Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. So those are the two passages that come right out in my mind. The law and the prophets. The law, the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 5. And the prophets, Habakkuk. You know, I, I think it's Habakkuk chapter 4. And these two verses both say, and there's other passages too, that the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, so, um, you know, I guess he could have even said the writings also say this. But I don't know if there are any passages in the Psalms that specifically say the righteous shall live by faith. So, uh, at least he, you know, he's able to show the Bible, the Old Testament Bible for the Jewish people is the evidence that we will be saved by a Messiah, and if we put our trust in him, he is the one who saves us. So verse 22 says, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is the explanation from the earlier part of the chapter, and verse 24 says, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
Okay, so this is you know, one of the most important verses in the Bible. All have sinned and fall short, short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Okay, so that word redemption is, is an important word. Right, so that, that's a Greek word that talks about, so what, what do you think redemption means? Saved. Okay, it means to be saved. So, but it actually has um, an understanding uh, that we had, that there was something that had happened to us in the past. Think about when the devil introduced sin, he tempted Adam and Eve into sin, and what did he do to them? When they fell into sin, what happened to them? What did he do? Uh, Satan. When Satan, as a serpent, uh, in, uh, tempted Adam and Eve, what was their life like after that? Terrible. That's right. So, but they was kind of like they they were free in the Garden of Eden, and then, old, and then after this, what happened they to got them? Kicked out. They got kicked out. So, what was it? But what was their life like? Could they live perfectly? They had to work. They, they, um, the consequences of their sin followed them, death followed them, right. pain followed them, illness and, and disease, all these things. The curse, exactly, the curse of the fall. And so <clears throat> the Bible says that if we sin, we are a slave to sin. So if you're a slave, how can we, how do you no longer be, how do you get rid of that slavery? You have to be bought back. <clears throat> yeah, you have to be bought back. That's what the word redemption means. Redemption means to be bought back, to be purchased, to be um, redeemed is to, to be taken out of the status of being a slave to becoming a child of God. As long as we're slaves of sin, we can't be children of God. It's either one or the other. So Jesus is the one who redeems us. When he died on the cross, he actually had to pay something. He paid with his own life. Right, so, so that's what it's talking about. And who did he pay? Well, that, that's the interesting thing. I mean, does Jesus, does God pay the devil to redeem us? In some ways, the devil is in control of the world. The Bible says that the devil is in control of the world. So he did buy us back from him, but the devil doesn't get anything. You know, Jesus, he doesn't control Jesus' life. Who Jesus paid was God. The Father. He paid the price for our sin. God demands the sin that souls, the, I'm sorry, the soul that sins shall die. <laughs> That's from Ezekiel. The soul that sins shall die. So if we sin, then God demands our life as payment for our sin. Jesus' infinite life, because he's God, paid for all of our sin. And so he was paying God the Father on behalf of our sin so that our lives would not be taken. And so when he redeems us, he pays the Father for us, but he redeems us from slavery under the devil. So it's almost like God is the judge. The devil uh, lays claim on all those who've rebelled because he is the chief rebeller, right? So he's, uh, he's, he says, if you can't live with God, I get you. And so Jesus pays the father back so that the devil has no claim on us. See, the devil never can be paid. God doesn't owe the devil anything. So Jesus didn't pay his life on the cross to pay the devil back, but he did win us back from the devil's control. He redeemed us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Uh, and so we see that um, in verse 24, it says that we are justified, and then it also uses that word redemption. So those two words together, to be justified is just as if I never sinned, so God changes the status. To be justified is like, a, is like a, uh, a law court declaring us not guilty. Right? So the Father says, uh, you are not guilty because Jesus has already paid the penalty. Right? Like if you got caught speeding, and then the judge says, you know, well, you know, if you can't pay this huge fine of $1,000 for speeding, you will go to jail. And then your lawyer says, you know... Um, well, Judge, I, I'm going to pay that ticket for my client, and he, and you know, it's all paid in free, uh, and all paid in clear. And the judge says, "Okay, uh, it, the penalty has been paid, and then you're free to go." So he slams his gavel down, and then the, and you know, so Jesus is our defense lawyer, and he pays the penalty, and we can go free. So it doesn't mean we didn't do the crime; it just means we don't do the time, right? Because if we couldn't pay it, we'd have to go to jail. Jesus sets us free. He paid for it, and the, and the Father justifies us by declaring us free to go. 
You know, in essence, it's even more than that because he even says we're not guilty because he says, as far as east is from the west, so your sin has been separated from you. And it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, I shall remember their sins no more. So when God says you are justified, it literally means not only that you are, that your sin has been paid for, but it also means you are considered not guilty. It's kind of like a technicality, right? Like in, in law, there are loopholes. If you are um, released from a crime, let's say you were found not guilty, and then later on they have evidence that shows that you actually did the crime. That the technicality is that our, the law in the United States says you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. So if you've been, you know, um, I don't. If you were um, considered not guilty, then it doesn't matter what whatever evidence has been dug up on you. You you can't be you know, condemned again. Kind of like, you know, um, uh, who was back in the 80s, the, um, the thing about if the glove don't, it doesn't fit, you can't acquit. Was it, what was that guy's name? The football player who uh, was accused of uh, killing somebody? Oh, yeah, I can't think of his name either. Yeah, off the top of my head, all of a sudden I forget. But, you know, he, if evidence was found that he had done it, then, then he can't be... Um, Try it again because he's already been considered not guilty, yeah, right? No, so, yeah, yeah. So you know, so we have that's what justification means. God doesn't ever bring anything back to us because He's already declared us not guilty, and it's you're only declared not guilty through faith because of God's grace and through the redemption that Jesus did by buying us back by paying the penalty. So it's all paid for. And there's nothing left. And, that's right. It, exactly. Two things have to happen at the cross, otherwise God is not. You know, if God doesn't punish sin, then he's not just. And if he, and if he only punishes sin, then he's not merciful. But in Jesus Christ, he's both just and merciful because sin is paid for, Jesus died, and then uh, through faith he, he distributes his grace and he can be merciful by freeing us uh, through faith in Jesus. So... Um, both things have to happen in on the cross in order for God to um, to be to be the God that we know that the Bible teaches, right? You know, God is not a God of wrath. You know, the end of the commandments in Exodus chapter twenty it says, you know, that you know he it, that he visits the sins to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but he blesses a thousand generations of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So we know that God's uh, you know main motivation is mercy and love you know guys he's a god of grace not a god of anger you know also in ezekiel it says that god does not desire the death of the sinner but that the sinner turns from his sin and lives uh, so there's lots of places in the bible that teach that same uh, hope uh, and the god's love for us so you know in the book of romans here paul's trying to describe all these different things that are already found in the old testament Verse 25, he goes on to say, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So again, we have a you know, very important uh, word here. The word in verse 25 that says a sacrifice for atonement is actually a Greek phrase that means propitiation. Propitiation um, is uh, it's kind of a fancy word that I think the, the Greek word literally is the, it's the word that the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses to translate the, the name of the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of the Ark of the Covenant, inside the holy place, there was the two angels, the, the um, cherubim, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And in between, they, there was this place where they would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb, and this was called the Mercy Seat. They actually had a, a special name for that place where they would sprinkle the blood on the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest would go in and, and offer the sacrifice of the Lamb so that the sins of the nation would be forgiven. And he would sprinkle the blood on the Mercy Seat. Well, that name for the word Mercy Seat is the is the Greek in the Greek is the word here that is used for the sacrifice of atonement, and so it's it's amazing to see that connection with 
God's mercy in the Old Testament, and now Jesus is literally the mercy seat. He is the place where God's mercy is seen at its clearest. So when we have faith in Jesus' blood, then it, it connects us to what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was becoming the sacrificial lamb. He was the one whose blood forgave the sins of the people, even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The Old Testament, it says, why didn't God punish their sins? Well, he says here, he did, um, he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So he hadn't punished sin the way it deserved to be punished with you know, eternal condemnation until Jesus actually went to the cross. Everybody in the Old Testament was saved not because of the sacrifices that they offered, because those sacrifices were just a, um, a foreshadowing of Jesus. You know, there are passages in the Bible, like in Psalm 51, you know, sacrifices you do not desire or I would give them, David wrote. And then there's some other passages that says this, um, the blood of bulls and goats do not pay for sin. And so if God is saying, if, if it says in God's word that the sacrifices don't pay for sin, why did they offer the sacrifices? Well, first of all, God commanded it and they were supposed to be a foreshadowing so that when Jesus came, we would know that he was the true Messiah because if we didn't know that the sacrifices were pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, then people would not necessarily understand why did the Savior have to die. See, because that's one of the stumbling blocks. These Jewish um, people said, how can the Messiah die on the cross? And remember, after Jesus rose from the dead, he says he started on the road to Emmaus. He said he started with the law and the prophets and began to explain how it had to be that the Messiah had to suffer and to die and on the third day rise again. So he explained these things. We don't know which verses he may have used, but we can be pretty sure that he outlined God's plan of salvation from the very beginning, right? Genesis 3.15, there's a passage where um, it says, when God was cursing um, the serpent, he said, the seed of the woman shall crush the seed of the serpent. Ye, you shall bruise, no, you shall strike, uh, he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. So it was talking about how the Messiah would be a descendant of Adam and Eve and that even though the serpent and the devil and all those that are under the devil's control would attack the Messiah, Jesus Christ, it would only be a strike on the heel. You know, you get bitten by a snake, you know, it, it, it can be pretty painful. It might even lead, you know, to death, but it's certainly not as devastating as if you smash the head of a snake because if you crush the head of a serpent, it's not coming back, it's, it's gone. Jesus, when he was crucified, it looked like he was dead, but he didn't die. It was only a strike on the heel. He rose again, he was alive. So Jesus lived, whereas the devil and his power were completely crushed. Satan was destroyed when Jesus died on the cross because no longer can anybody, uh, no, no longer will anybody be, have to go to hell for their sins. You know, nobody has to go to hell for their sins. So the devil can't claim anybody. The only reason a person will go to hell is because either they don't want the payment that Jesus gave them or they, um, or they believe that they, what they've done is enough. But, you know, I don't need Jesus. Or they say, well, I'm good enough. And, then, you know, if you think that you're good enough, then you need to read back in Romans 3. There is no one who does righteous, not even one. They have all turned away and, done, and, and together have become worthless. No one seeks God. So if we think that we're good enough on our own, the answer is, nope, we uh, fall short of the glory of God. And if we think that Jesus did, we don't need Jesus to sacrifice on the cross, then we are um, uh, dishonoring God himself. Because Jesus' sacrifice was the greatest thing that, he, that God has ever done. See, when Jesus died on the cross, that was his moment of glory. See, the world doesn't think of that as glor glorious. They think that that's a horrible thing. You know, oh, what a shame that this Palestinian preacher died so young. That's what people think. People who don't believe that Jesus is God, they say, what a shame. What, maybe Jesus could have done so much more if he wouldn't have died. And they think that he never rose again. You know, they, there's people, Buddhists and stuff, who admire his moral teachings. But Jesus wasn't just a moral teacher because if he, was, if he said, I am the son of God and that I will rise again and he didn't actually do it and he wasn't really God's son, then he was really a liar. And to say that a liar is a moral teacher is really incongruous. It's, it's, it's a paradox. It's, it can't be possible. If Jesus said something that wasn't true, then he's not moral and we shouldn't listen to him. 
But if it was true, then we certainly can't just call him a teacher. He's, he is either the son of God or he isn't. And so people who, um, who, who misunderstand what Jesus was doing on the cross think of it as a sad thing, but that's why as Christians we can call the crucifixion Good Friday. It was good because Jesus was fulfilling the will of the Father, was paying for the sins of the world, for the joy put, uh, set before him, he, he, um, he, did not, he was not, uh, well, how's it go? Uh, for this joy set before him, he, he, um, he did not uh, avoid the cross, right? Jesus endured, endured the cross, that's where you go. He endured the cross for us out of joy. You know, who would, think, who would think of dying and suffering as joy? And Jesus did only because he knew that uh, you were worth it. He loved you that much. And so it was joy for him. You know, if you love somebody, you know you would do anything for them. If you really, really love them, then you would do anything for them. If Jesus loved you that much, he would do anything for you. And so that's what this is all about. You know, how can you turn away from that type of love? And yet there are people who do, right? It's only, and really, I would say that the word love and faith are interchangeable in Scripture. So when it says that you are justified freely, what's this? Um, let's see. Uh, let me read that verse again. That uh, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. If you put your faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, if you love him for what he did for you, then you... Uh, are saved. It says he put left the sins beforehand, left unpunished. So he didn't punish the people in the Old Testament because Jesus' sacrifice was coming and God was patient. And so in the Old Testament, if a person trusted that God would take care of their sin, that was enough. And then the payment came when Jesus came. And then it says in verse 26 that he did it. Why, why does God allow sin to go unpunished? Because he was demonstrating his justice at the present time so as to be the one who was just and the one who justifies. So those two words are being used to be the one who is just and the one who justifies is really just a kind of a play on words to say that he is both the one who is, he does punish sin and he is merciful. If you justify somebody, then you're showing them mercy because you're giving them the justification for being able to be a child of God. You know, they're, they're not, a, you're not, we're not a child of God because of our merits, but because of what Jesus has done. So when Jesus died on the cross, God is just because he punishes sin and he justifies all those who put faith in Jesus Christ by forgiving their sins. So it's interesting how he can use the same base word, just and justified, but they mean opposites. One is punishing sin, one is giving grace and forgiveness. Complete opposites. He justifies us through faith. He doesn't count our sins against us, but he can also be the one who is, um, he is a, a just judge because sin was punished. Uh, and then verse 27. So now he's getting to the point where there were, there were people at the time of the first century who were trying to... Um, to argue different things, and Paul's trying to put things into perspective. So he says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. So think about, you know, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, they like to boast, we're children of God. We're children of Abraham. See, this is the argument that Jesus was having with the Pharisees back in John's gospel, which we looked at a couple of months back. In John's gospel, they said, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus says, no, you're children of the devil because he is a liar and so are you. And, you know, and he says, God can create children of Abraham from these rocks. So a child of Abraham is a person who has the faith of Abraham, not somebody who you know, claims to be, you know, have a Jewish blood flowing through their veins. Because um, if you're calling Jesus a, a demon, so that's, that's what the Pharisees were saying. He said, isn't it true that you're demon-possessed? Isn't it true you're a Samaritan? Well, no, all those things were lies that they were spreading because they were trying to get him killed because they wanted to, you know, they were jealous of his, of his um, power, of his authority. They were jealous of his being, becoming more popular. They wanted to keep the influence and the power for themselves, and so they couldn't even see the fact that they were sinful. And, uh, and so um, we can't boast 
on our own good works. We exclude any boasting when it comes to our good works. Uh, you know, for the people in Rome who had become Christians, there, there was sometimes a, um, a division within the early church between people who were Jewish Christians and people who were Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians like to say, well, we're better Christians than you Gentile Christians because we observe the law. And Paul says, no, 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 you were given the law as a gift to share with the world. And if you think that you're better because you observe the law better than other people, or maybe you have it and the other people don't, that's, that's not true. Don't boast in the law. Only boast uh, in Jesus Christ. So, so he's, he's saying the same thing that he said in the first three chapters. Uh, but he, he makes it more plain here when he says, no, uh, you know, on, on what principles is boasting excluded? It's, a, it, it's on the principle of observing the law because nobody can do it, which he has said earlier. But he says, on, uh, but on faith, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And then he goes on to say in verse 29, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith. Remember that whenever you hear the word circumcised, that's the, that, to a Jewish person that means Jew, you are Jewish. You know, If you're circumcised, you're Jewish. So he says that God will justify the circumcised or the Jewish person by faith and the uncircumcised or the Gentile through the same faith. So it doesn't matter if you have this ritual of circumcision or not. Because if you don't have faith, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you could go through the motions. This is true of anybody in the Christian church. You could say, well, I pray every day. I give my uh, offerings all every week. I show up at church all the time. I'm real pious. You're not saved by being pious. You're saved because you trust in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus is the only thing that matters. And if you trust in Jesus, it will show. If Jesus is in your heart, then the fruit in your life will be evident. You can't keep, you know, uh, an apple tree can't produce thorns and a thorn bush can't produce fruit. You know, a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. So we, we just look at the fruit. And, and it's not really our job to go around t pointing out other people saying, you know, oh, look, you're not producing any fruit and you're, you know, you, you're obviously not a child of God. You know, it has more to do with like uh, self-examination. Am I producing God's fruit? Is the Holy Spirit evident in my life? And, you know, how do you work on that? Well, it says in John's Gospel, Jesus says, you know, ask, you know, if, a, if your heavenly father knows what, you know, if earthly parents know how to give good things to their children, how much more will your father in heaven not give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? So we simply ask for the Holy Spirit and then the evidence of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. So we can say, Lord, give me the fruit of the Spirit. Give me your Holy Spirit. And then he promises to do that. Well, certainly the Holy Spirit's going to be working on you. So that if you are not patient, then the Holy Spirit will convict you of your impatience so that you can start working on becoming more patient. You know, and, and that's true of all the different, you know, because I think that there's probably an opposite for every fruit of the Spirit, right? Peace, or what's it, love, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Enjoy. <laughs> and so there's opposites of those. So if you don't have one of those, you probably have the opposite. And that's not a fruit of the spirit. That's the fruit of the flesh. And we need to, you know, prune it, cut it off, and allow the good stuff to grow. So, you know, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it out. So anything that's evil in your life, cut it out. You know, and, and to start working on what God can do. And God is the gardener, and he will prune your life. Sometimes he'll do it without you wanting to or without you, you know, trying. If there's something evil in your life, if, if you're walking in the way of the Lord, even though you may be clinging on to this part of your life that you, that's not good for you, the Holy Spirit uh, will convict your heart and the God, the gardener, will cut it out. So sometimes things happen to us and we don't like them, but it's for our own good, right? So because of uh, God being the gardener, we can trust that he has the best uh, interests of our lives in mind. So this is good news for the, um, for the people of Rome, that church at Rome, where these Jewish and Gentile believers are hearing Paul saying, you know, it, it's good that the Jewish people brought the, God, uh, brought the knowledge of the Messiah to the world, but let's not get confused. 
Nobody is saved by being Jewish. You're only saved because you trust in God's promises. Trusting in the Messiah through faith is what it's all about. And then, you know, um, verse 31 in the end of this chapter, he says, Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. See, because that, that was the kind of the opposite reaction. Some of maybe the Jewish people would say, Okay, if we're not saved by faith, uh, faith, by works but by faith then that means we don't need to follow the law anymore. See that's that's the opposite end of the spectrum. you got people who say you have to follow all the laws to be a good Christian and then there's people on the other end of the spectrum who say well if the law doesn't matter and we're saved by faith then you don't have to obey any of the laws. So either obey them all or obey or, or not obey any of them. Either one of those are, bo those are both wrong. Right? They're ends, opposite ends of the spectrum. One is called legalism and one is called antinomianism. Antinomianism means you anti-legal. You know, say you, you're saying that you don't need to follow the laws. That means you can just um, go wild and just do whatever. Because obviously, if God's going to forgive you and you just ask for forgiveness, shall we sin so that grace may abound? And Paul says later on in his letter, no, no, we should we shouldn't do that. So you know, this last verse then is is kind of addressing that issue. Do we nullify the law by faith? If you if if you're saved because you trust in Jesus, does that mean that the law is not necessary? And he's saying, no, the law is necessary because it's the very thing that demanded a price and Jesus did the, live the perfect life for us. And so we're actually upholding the law by trusting in Jesus because we're trusting in the one who fulfilled it. He lived the law perfectly. He never had any idols. He never took God's name in vain. He never um, broke the Sabbath day, even though the Pharisees... That was the first thing they jumped on. Oh, he's breaking the Sabbath day. He's, he's practicing medicine on the Sabbath day because he's healing people. Well, that was their definition. God's definition of the Sabbath day rest is resting in God's love and you can never break a commandment by doing good, right? How can it be wrong to heal people, to love people, to restore people? Restoration is, see, because the word for peace to, and when it says you shall rest on the Sabbath day, you shall be at peace. The word is shalom, right? Shalom. And it's often the word that's used in Hebrew to say hello. You know, when you meet somebody on the street, you say shalom, which means peace. But it literally means wholeness. And so to, to rest in God's peace, to have a real peaceful Sabbath day, it doesn't mean that you just rest and don't do any work. It means you rest in God's wholeness. True wholeness is seen in, in the, um, the forgiveness of sins, because your, your spirit is whole. The, the body being restored to health, health is wholeness, um, not having any shame or guilt or anger towards other people, that's the emotional wholeness and peace. So all those things Jesus promoted and gave, and if the Pharisees were saying that he didn't fulfill the Sabbath day by, because he was actually doing shalom, peace, and wholeness for the people by healing them, then they had a very warped view of what the law actually said. They had no idea that... There are examples in the Old Testament of people doing that very thing. Is it, is it wrong to help your neighbor get their ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath day? Well, the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy actually give us examples of people working on the Sabbath day in fulfillment of the law. It says if your neighbor's um, donkey or ox falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you can get it out. If you're, you know, if you're starving to death on the Sabbath day, going in the field and getting some food is not a bad thing. David did it. David brought, gave food for his um, army, you know, and took it out of the temple. And he didn't break the Sabbath day and he didn't break God's laws because doing good is always okay. You can't break a law by doing something good. And, uh, and so we're seeing here that um, Jesus then fulfills the law and if you put your faith in Jesus, then, then that fulfillment of the law is applied to you. You know, you are considered not guilty because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. So uh, this is good news for the Jewish person. They don't have to worry about that the law is thrown out the window. It's good news for the Gentile person because they don't have to live up to the law because they, you know, they can't anyways. But, you know, that's the thing that the Jewish people, some of the Jewish people, Christians were trying to hold in their face, you know, you need to get circumcised to go to heaven and, and Jesus, Jesus did it all for us. Um, you know, the, the background behind circumcision was that it was an outward sign that you belong to the people of God, but now God has given us something that supersedes that. In our baptism, we are made children of God. 
not by an outward act, but by an inward change. The Holy Spirit's given to us. God puts his claim on us. And so in the New Testament, we have um, the same principles at work, but we have the fulfillment in Jesus, not by what we do. Okay, what's, it's uh, noon, so let's uh, start fresh next week with chapter 4.